Hi everybody, Charles Hoskinson here. As promised, here is the governance video. Yay, governance video. Not so live from not so warm, not so sunny Colorado, late at night. All right, so uh, let's understand the governance ideology, the what, what we're pushing. Uh, you have to really understand where we came from with staking. So in the beginning we had OBFT. And OBFT was static and federated. For those of you who don't know, that's Ouroboros BFT. This was the original protocol for Cardano. And we said, well, we'd like to go to a state where we are dynamic and decentralized. Okay, so we're going to go from static and federated to dynamic and decentralized. And we thought a lot about that, and we said, oh, well, that's Praos, Ouroboros Praos. Depends on who you ask how to pronounce that. And we said, well, wait a minute here. There's this huge competency gap in that the people running the system, not us and our friends, uh, they're going to have to know how to run the system. So we need kind of training wheels to do that. And we said, all right, well, we have this concept called the ITN, the Incentivized Test Net. We ran that for six months. And it accomplished two things. One, it allowed us to verify that Prowse works the way we thought it worked. Two, it was training wheels for people. You know, kind of like when you learn how to ride a bicycle, you put training wheels on it until you feel comfortable. You take them off, and then suddenly you can ride the bike comfortably. Okay. Well... Mission accomplished. Cardano is uh, getting to a point where more than 30% of the blocks are made by Prowse. And within just a few months, uh, we'll break the 50% point. And uh, in quarter one of next year, we're on target for D to equal zero, which means that the entire system will be dynamic and decentralized. And we no longer need training wheels. And the other side of this is that we needed to have a conversation a conversation uh, about system parameters. Uh, something like K, something like A naught, a whole bunch of stuff. And we now see emerging out of this conversation uh, organizations like Spacra forming. We see emerging out of this conversation uh, partial delegation, delegation portfolios, all kinds of creative cool things in a vast improvement of the delegation experience and the stake pool operation. Like for example, I made a video where we talked about segregation of stake pool operation between cold and hot. So basically you can run something on like Amazon Web Services and then you can on a ledger have most of your delegation keys. Okay, and this is what people would delegate to. Now what does it mean? You have a very secure operating environment and if your environment ever gets compromised, you can always reconstruct a new one. Okay, so this is the direct result of conversations with rank and file state pool members, the community as a whole. We could not have these conversations if the community didn't learn what Cardano is all about, what the protocol is all about, decentralization is all about, yeah, how to run a state pool. There are very informed people, in fact, people equally informed, in some cases better informed than the people working at my company about the realities of staking. So when we ask how can we do better, their opinion matters. It's an informed opinion. There's money on the line. It's a business. Okay. So governance is much the same way in my view. You cannot build a successful governance system unless you have at least two things. You have to have knowledge and then you have to have participation. Okay, you have to have a situation where people participate and people know what the hell they're doing. Here, we have over a thousand stake pool operators. And because they had six months, because they had training wheels, because there's money on the line, they learned very quickly uh, how to run the game to a point where they have an opinion and that opinion matters. It's valid. Uh, it actually has teeth behind it, people behind it. Organizations are forming to lobby for that opinion. That's effective governance of the stake pool side. So we say governance in general, we need a system 
that encourages lots of people. And when we say participation, we mean ADA holders. Okay. And knowledge, we mean they kind of have a rough idea about stuff. And that's a hard one, right? What does stuff mean? So stuff can mean the technicals of the protocol. Stuff can mean marketing. Stuff can mean running a business. Uh, stuff can mean partnership development. Stuff can mean writing a DAP. Stuff can mean a lot of stuff. And that's really challenging, right? Here, we're going from a particular use case, the operation of the protocol itself, which is complex, but finite. And here, we're talking about a very, very abstract thing. The other problem when we talk about participation is we're talking about a very, very abstract thing as well, because what does ADA holder mean? For example, does it mean you actually own ADA? Okay, that's one type of ADA holder. But what if you're like, you know, a domain expert who's just floating around in the community and doesn't have a lot of ADA, but you also have a lot of specialized knowledge? Or, you know, what if you're a government official who's considering using Cardano protocol uh, for elections or something? You know, there's a hundred different constituencies there of participation, people within the system, people outside of the system, people considering to use the system. So this is a question of who, who should. And then in terms of knowledge, like what's valuable? These are very difficult questions. And actually that means that the governance component, if you really think about it, is the single hardest component of all cryptocurrencies. This is why Vitalik and others are actually against on-chain governance. They don't think it's possible to achieve. And they advocate for dictatorships until the project decentralizes. And they act as if somehow forces outside of the system will decide how the system will converge. Uh, and we've seen this with Bitcoin, for example, where it's taken 10 years for them to flirt with the idea of smart contracts to a point where they've finally gotten some primitives in for Taproot. 10 years. And this is after five years of market validation from Ethereum and deployment and huge amounts of competition, massive pushing, massive demand from Silicon Valley and so forth. So governance is hard and it's the hardest thing you can do. And if you don't believe that, you should ask yourself, what government has a perfect voting system? What government has a perfect set of leaders? What government on average always makes the right decisions and who gets to decide what decisions are right decisions and wrong decisions? You also have this concept of time horizon. Okay. And what that means is when you make decision D, it's always D of T one. And when you make a decision, D of T2, you know, there's a question of what's the time horizon of this? So you can have the same D, but a different time for it. So for example, uh, let's say that we invest a lot of money in marketing. That's the decision. And then we look at the outcome of that, two, one, excuse me. And we say, okay, D of T1, you know, what does that mean? And is it a success or failure? Well, what if only a month has passed and we don't have any appreciation of price, no adoption in these things. But let's say that we look at it again a year later and then suddenly our metrics look much better. So the problem is that when you start holding elections, you start talking about distribution of funds and outcomes. There's a temporal component as much as there is a component of the event and actions that are taken. And then there's auditability. So there's a question of how do we determine truth uh, from what occurred? So for example, Bob says, give me a bunch of money and I'll deploy a lot of ATMs and those ATMs will have ADA, uh, let's say an organ. Okay, well, who checks that? And how do we know? It's a protocol. What constitutes an expert? How do people in a system build reputation? There's a question of fairness that exists. What is fair? I'm an American. We have this baked into our blood, egalitarianism. We say one vote, one person. Okay. Well, is that particularly fair? Let's say five people own a timeshare. 
and four of them put in uh, the vast majority of the money, 99% of the money, and the last one chipped in 1% of the money. Should they all have an equal vote on who gets to use the timeshare? Is that fair? Shareholder governance, corporation. Let's say you have 100 owners and 20 of those owners own 99% of the shares. Should the other 80 have equal say? Is that truly fair? These are a question, uh, when we say time horizon, there's a consequences of decisions. So for example, let's say you get the vote. Will you stick around for the consequences of your vote? So let's say that uh, people in England got the vote for Brexit. What if 50% of the people who are voting for it, for it or against it, were planning on moving outside of the UK after they had voted? Would you consider that to be a fair election? If the people who are voting on something will have permanent consequences, positive, negative on a country, it's all about opinion, aren't going to be around to see what happens. It's kind of like, let's say you have a CEO who's retiring and that CEO unilaterally decides to merge with another company, but doesn't handle the merger himself or herself and leaves. Is that a reasonable business strategy? So there's a fairness of weight of your vote, voice. Should it be just a characteristic or should it be based on value? Should it be based on merit? And then how do you define merit? These types of things. And then vote, there's a temporal factor. How often? And then, you know, do you actually, are you vested with the system? Or are you going to leave? What if exchanges get to vote? They don't own the ADA. Oh, no. And there's dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of other questions that will come up when you really start analyzing all these things. And people, they tend to have knee-jerk reactions and make proclamations. And they oftentimes, they Dunning-Kruger their way into a particular voting system. And they say, this voting system is the best voting system. You have things like Eros Paradox. You can look that up. Okay. And there's all kinds of other things that come up in political science that study these particular systems. You have different voting systems too. There's up, down, yes, no. There's preference voting where you pick a collection of things. Like I like A the most, then B, then D, then C. And then somebody else say, no, no, no. I like D the most, then C, then A, uh, then B. That's Those are my preferences. Okay, preference voting. Then you can have approval voting where you say somebody's in charge. And that person will make the decisions until uh, his or her approval falls below a certain threshold. Quadratic voting. Okay, there's dozens of voting systems that you can also use. So the question is, how do we handle governance for Cardano? And I've thought about this more than I think anything else that I've ever thought about in the entire time I've been in the cryptocurrency space. Because ultimately, this is the silver bullet. People ask, what will get you to a trillion dollars? People ask, what will make you the most competitive platform. It has nothing to do with how, the quality of the code, the smart contract system, any of these things. Because you know what? You can always adopt the best on market. It's all open source technology. What matters is your governance structure. Because if you have a good one, here's what happens with your growth. It's like that scene at the end of Farscape where Crichton finally shows the black hole and it goes from nothing to something, to something slightly larger, to something slightly larger and larger and larger and larger. And then you start getting the idea that, whoa, this is a bad deal. Similarly, no matter where you start on the spiral, if you have a good governance system, your system will absorb more and more and more and more people to the point where the system becomes the system with a billion people. Because those people feel valued, they feel like they have a voice, and they stick around and they bring friends and family into the system and they feel that it's fair. They feel that the system is legitimate and they feel that all opposing systems don't have this capability. And you know, you get this enormous wisdom of the crowds. There's actually a great book called Wisdom of the Crowds. And, you know, we tend to think, oh, crowds are stupid. You know, the mob is bad, blah, blah, blah. And that's just not true. 
The reality is that when you look at collectives of people, if the social dynamics of those crowds are correct, there is no one smarter than the crowd. And there's people like Alex Pentland, for example, who study this stuff. And they call it social physics. He wrote actually several books on this. And there's other people who think about these things. But if the social dynamics are right. You have a good idea flow, good communication in those crowds. The crowds collectively make extremely good decisions. There's a ton of evidence for that. When you actually read the papers and you look at things. So the question is, how do we get the right social dynamics? How do we get a system that people perceive to be fair? How do we get a system that has high participation and a system where over time, the knowledge increases, okay? Now, we have evidence from the stake pool experiment that starting with training wheels is probably a pretty good idea. Lo and behold, what we're doing with Catalyst, the whole Voltaire experiment. So what are we doing? We're saying, oh, okay, we have this concept of the DC fund, and we're right now in fund one, and we're focus grouping and talking about things and building interfaces. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about fund two. And this is the first time every single holder of ADA gets the vote on $250,000 worth of ADA that will be in the treasury system on how to use that. And we have a ballot system and innovation management system. And tomorrow we're going to go through all of that. Okay. And this is this month in October. Now, the point of this is that we want to replicate this spiral. Here's the hypothesis that we have. And, you know, these things are hypothesis, hypothesis, hypotheses. The hypothesis is that if you put a little money pot, people will show up and want part of it and they have to go through a structured process to ask, called a ballot. And then what we can do is put a process, it's called innovation management, and we have a great partner and that innovation management partner is called IdeaScale and they specialize in this type of stuff. And what they do is they take what you've proposed and work with you and work with the community and that's what we started doing with Fund One as a prototype and a focus group and they get you to a better ballot ballot two okay and this ballot is superior it has a higher chance of being approved and they'll work with you to iterate and iterate and iterate and some subset of these things will get approved and every six to eight weeks we're going to do that. Launch funds with the Cardano Treasury. The stake pool rewards, some go to the stake pools and the delegators. Some are already going into the treasury account that lives in Cardano. It's managed by the blockchain itself, uh, and funds can be moved over into treasury tranches. People vote, and then they decide to either just return it to the treasury, or they decide to distribute it to ballot proposals that people have. My hypothesis is that what this is going to do is increase participation. And my other hypothesis is this is going to discuss priorities. Okay. This is one. This is two. And then three, develop thought leaders. And four, improve UX, UI of voting in general. So every time a fund ha comes, the amount of funds available will increase. The amount of ballots submitted will increase. The quality of the ballots, because the innovation management process will develop competency and will develop thought leadership, will increase we will have more clarity on the priorities of the protocol in general, not Charles Hoskinson's priorities, not the Cardano Foundation's priorities, but the priorities of all ADA holders. 
And every time we do this, we get a focus group because people participate. They go to Reddit, they go to Telegram, they tell us directly, they go to Twitter, they complain. It will improve just like the staking experience is improving rapidly. It's going to improve the UI UX of voting. We have a voting app that's going to be launched and we'll have a voting center in Daedalus itself. In fact, we're tendering a bid right now to accelerate the development of that voting center. I've approved a larger budget for that. Every time we do this, it's like living on the spiral. Okay, so the first few funds, it's small and doesn't seem like a big deal, but it establishes a mechanic. And the other thing is that each time we do this, it's not just the UI UX, but also the methods of voting. So we currently have threshold voting. We're exploring preference voting. We'll also explore other systems like, for example, quadratic voting, different ballot architectures, multi-stage voting. Okay. We also have something called voting registration that we're going to be pushing in with the next HFC event, which will prevent exchanges from voting with your ADA. There's all kinds of cool things that we've come up with that we're brainstorming and testing. Now, what this will do is help us in two domains. It's going to help us in that abstract, ill-defined domain of knowledge. Because you're constructing an expert class, you're constructing a dialogue, you have a structured process for innovation management, and there's lots of idea flow and the social dynamics are moving in that direction. And if we do this right, because that honeypot keeps growing, you get higher and higher participation because everybody wants to be funded. You want ambassadors. The foundation can't hire all the ambassadors. And some people say, this is not a fair process. So my response to that is, well, then screw them. Go to the community and say, you are damn qualified to be an ambassador, and you'll be the first set of ambassadors approved by the community itself and funded by the community itself. It feels more legitimate than one organization just asserting that, right? Well, go prove that. You want to run a podcast? I already gave a challenge for three podcasts. We have two of the three already established with candidates. They should immediately go and do what I told them to do. Apply for the DC fund. They probably will win. Those pilot podcasts that they do will be uh, their resume and the community will decide should we hire these people or not and guess what it's priority because they are comparing those ideas to other ideas and you the community will get to decide so when we do that crowdcast tomorrow we're going to talk all about phase one and every six to eight weeks we keep doing this the experience gets better the sophistication gets better more money is at stake more ballots are flowing you develop an expert class of thought leaders, and eventually the thought leaders can form kind of a governance layer of the system. They not personally have a lot of ADA, but because we're embracing something called liquid democracy, liquid feedback, what this effectively means is that people can delegate, just like they delegate to a stake pool, their ADA voice to domain experts in the community. So even if you personally are not very vested, you can end up being very powerful because people can give you their voice. And you can even make money from this. This thought leadership eventually can become a job, just like stake pool operation can become a job. Okay. Now, along the way, as this is a hypothesis and it's experiment, we're collecting data, we're learning, we're focus grouping. And there are domain experts we're going to be bringing in, organizations we're going to be bringing in who specialize in these types of things to advise us. Right now, we're really curious about improving the quality of ballots. So we already got one of the top partners in the, in the world, IdeaScale, and we signed a contract with them. We're working with them. But we're also working with Submittable for the ballot architecture process. The first cohort will be messy. The next one will be less messy. But data will come nonetheless from each and every one. And then we can talk to those domain experts, and we can talk about better social physics, better social dynamics, improving the wisdom of the crowd, we can talk just like we talk with stake pool operators about a more fair, more robust system for stake pool operators. We can talk about how to create an expert class in the system and have thought leaders emerge and have more diversity of voice. Okay. Now, this is an evolutionary mechanic, just like the ITN was an evolutionary mechanic. And it will take months and months and months and months and months to mature and evolve. But every time we do that, we climb the spiral and we get more certain in this thing. Eventually, we'll get to a point where this is not just about funding things, but it's deciding about CIPs, Cardano Improvement Proposals, 
So when we talk about an HFC event, so hard forking the protocol and evolving Cardano, okay, we can either talk about parameters or we can talk about design. In both cases, all these voting mechanics and experiments can be re-leveraged to then decide on new parameters. And the community will have all the tools necessary to do that. And it'll have privacy and security and high participation and ease of use uh, and so forth. Okay. So somewhere on the spiral, it'll assume the CIP process, and then the community will be totally in control of the parameters and design of the system. So they control the funding, that's the treasury, the who pays of sustainability, and they'll control the CIP process, which is the who decides. And the beautiful thing is we'll have an enormous amount of evidence and data about uh, whether this system is stable or not. And by definition, it's stable if the system can converge reliably to decisions and the community accepts those decisions, meaning that we don't have a Cardano Classic and a Cardano Cash. This is the hypothesis. If we can accomplish this, we will be the most valuable cryptocurrency in the world because we can absorb all other innovations of other cryptocurrencies. We won't lose community, but we're always gaining community and we can always pay for the next step in our evolution. It may take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but it's just like that Farscape episode where it keeps doubling. And so in the beginning, it looks small, but you notice that the pattern of growth is inevitable. This is the magic of companies like Tesla and SpaceX. When you have exponential growth on your side, you can't lose. Musk looked at batteries and he said, well, hang on a second here. Everybody in the world is investing billions of dollars into making batteries lighter, charging faster, uh, more reliable, cheaper to make, easier to recycle because we have cell phones and mobile devices. And everybody wants a cell phone with a bigger battery that charges faster. It has nothing to do with battery power cars, but he's downstream of that enormous investment wave. So he just has to survive long enough until he has a battery that lasts 2,000 miles. Okay. And the minute that he's there, people start thinking, why do I need charging infrastructure? I can just charge it at home, kind of like an oil change that you get every 2,000 miles. So it's a game of surviving long enough for the growth to take you in a direction where you went. It was the same when Gordon Moore was looking at semiconductors. And he said, these vacuum tubes, they're king today, but the way that transistors are growing, the density is growing, the capability of improving the system is growing. Eventually, we're going to be somewhere on the curve, and there's no question that this technology is going to win. It's just a game of surviving long enough, then you can have ge uh, general purpose computation and the CPU is born. That was the business model of Intel and that's why they're so big. So that's the game for us is how do we unlock the wisdom of the crowds? And the beautiful thing is this is something that has been studied for over 30 years. Hundreds of books have been written and it's incredibly well understood and there's really good ways of going about that from MIT stuff, the University of Michigan stuff, it's so beautiful. There's just great tools that are there. And it starts with this fund structure. And fund two is the first time everybody gets to participate and talk about that. And we'll keep growing and growing and growing from it. And every six to eight weeks, we keep reloading and keep going at it. And more and more people get funding, more and more people participate, more and more projects start, and they bring more people into the ecosystem. So you have this beautiful organic growth. And every time we do it, my hypothesis is that we'll get better experiences, more methods, more thought leaders, more priority discussion, and more participation. Eventually, we get to a point where we're far enough on the spiral where we can reach escape velocity and the entire evolution of the system is controlled by the community. And we regress nothing. And then IO Global is your humble servant, as are many other firms. At that stage, we say, we have a proposal to evolve the protocol. And there's this concept first among equals. It's basically our proposal is treated exactly the same as every other domain expert's proposal in the space. And we can band together, form a committee, a consolidation, a consortia that's decentralized, 
and as a group bid for the future of the system. And other groups will bid for the future of the system. And there's competition. We'll have to fight each other and justify each other for why our ideas are great. And the community ultimately gets to decide. So no matter who wins, you win. Because that group will be able to execute. And there are all the physics and the wisdom are in such a way the hard questions will be asked. Now you say, Charles, what evidence do you have for this hypothesis? The Cardano Foundation let a lot of people down because lately they've been a bit obscure, a bit opaque. They really have not had a lot of transparency about where they're going, what are they doing. So instead of the community just sitting on its hands and complaining and saying, how dare you get better? 700 people spontaneously came together and have started producing a very extensive community roadmap that has enormous merit. You know what's going to happen is a Hegelian dialectic. The foundation will say, hmm, and the community will say, hmm, and they'll come together and form a synthesis. And that synthesis that they form will be significantly better than anything that either side could have. What is the difference between that and funding the future roadmap for the system? When all these different firms can come together and form a decentralized consortium that will then fund and propose a future. We'll have all the hard conversations along the way. We just have to evolve the participation, the expert class, and the tools so that we get a similar outcome to what we got here with the stake pool operators. There is no doubt. They just have to be patient. I understand a lot of people come to Twitter, oh, it's not fair for the small stake pool operator. Ah, we're going to go out of business in a week if you don't take care of us. You know, that's noise. Bunker, hunker down, and in three to six months, the system will reach a stable equilibrium. And K will be where it needs to be, and the minimum costs will be where they need to be. And we'll have all kinds of things. Alliances form, and efficacy groups form, and delegation portfolios, and people won't even be delegating to individual pools anymore. Instead, it'll be delegating to groups of pools, and there'll be the SPACRA uh, you know, delegation portfolio, and the Cardano Foundation recommended one, and the IO Global recommended, and the Emergo recommended one, and the League of Women Voters recommended one. Okay, Any, Pick your favorite constituency, and users will look at all these different portfolios, and they'll click to that, and under the hood, people will be spontaneously coming and going. A market will form. Businesses will form. We're in kind of a, you know a fact finding right now, but we have enough competent people around to create a conversation where it will converge to something fair and stable. I have no doubt about that. We see all the signs pointing in that particular direction. It's frustrating, but we know where it's going. It's a sink, it's an attractor, okay? This process with the DC fund is gonna do the exact same thing. That's my hypothesis. It will force the evolution of voting systems. It will increase the level of participation. The quality of user experience will increase. The amount of people participating will be there. And the inf information level of those people will continue to increase. Some tools will be built by us. Some tools will be built by the community. Some tools will be built by professional e-voting companies that see a market opportunity to come in and work with us because it's a business like any other business of helping us decide. And it doesn't matter if this spiral takes a month, a year, five years, uh, it will get to where it needs to go. And I guarantee it will get to where it needs to go probably early next year or middle part of next year because these things tend to cascade just like that black hole. And then the CIP process will come in. We've pre-built it with the foundation. There's a lot of participation already. We're gonna keep hammering that anvil and get it to a point where it's really nice, CIP and CRC. And then the community will take the design of the parameters and there'll be consortium bidding for the future of the system. Once that has been achieved, it is inevitable that Cardano will succeed. There's no doubt in my mind because it's just no longer a situation of how do you compete with this or how do you compete with that? Our competitors, the Algorands, the EOSs and these others, they don't have this mindset of evolving to grow beyond them. They also don't have a mindset of uh, this continuous improvement in curating the growth of the community to a point as we've demonstrated with the stake pool operation to build checks and balances to overrule cults of personality. People often say, how do you fire your founders? You outgrow them. You don't get rid of them. You make them unnecessary. And then they're always there, like Steve Wozniak. He's always there with Apple. 
you, he'll be passing out iPhones when the latest iPhone thing comes around. And the, everybody looks at him with glowing admiration. But Apple has outgrown Steve Wozniak. And similarly, Cardano shall outgrow Charles Hoskinson. If this spiral is right, it is inevitable and it is the best thing in the world because it means that the system is truly, truly decentralized, not just in terms of consensus, but decentralized in terms of a reliance upon the brilliance of the few. Instead, the wisdom of the crowd supplants that. Now, we've already constructed everything we need for a decentralized brain. The University of Wyoming deal showed that U.S. institutions can take ADA for labs. That's only going to continue. Those mindset and dynamics are set. There's plenty of enterprising professors who know that they can now make money participating here. So not DC Fund 2, but probably 3, 4, 5. Some professors are going to start submitting ballots or we'll kind of push them a little bit. The minute that one of them gets funding, you know what happens is that they start talking to all their friends and they say, we got a new NSF in town. It's a lot better than the old one. And then a lot more will participate, which means we have competition on the scientific level. And we're going to have tons of competition on the engineering level. Many different clients constructed. Emergo already wants to construct a Rust full node, meaning there's client competition with the Haskell node. I guarantee at some point Vacuum Labs is probably going to wake up and say, well, we built Ada Light. Why the hell don't we also build a full node? Which means we have a lot more diversity than on the core infrastructure. And that is a direct consequence of the dynamics that we have set here today with this system with what we've done with Voltaire. That team is our A team. They're our fastest developing team in terms of their ability to put something in market. They built the ITN, they're building Voltaire, and it's all about getting the model right and the level of participation. right. And like the ITN, as that crystallizes to a final protocol, Voltaire 1.0 will be pulled into Cardano in the way that's nice, and then it'll completely take over the parameter and system design implications. It'll take over all those decisions that the system has to make. And at that point, Cardano is truly completely decentralized and the most decentralized cryptocurrency in the history of the space. And because of that, I see itself evolving to become whatever is necessary. Now, there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of participation to deal with, a lot of things to think about. Um, and this is going to be the single biggest series of debates that we have as a community which is why I keep making all these videos about think for yourself and disagree without being disagreeable and our conduct and also political philosophy and uh, basically just thoughts about the world. Because at the end of the day, you are the same as me. And this system only works if we have the right social dynamics and we have the right crowds. And if you have crowds of groupthink, crowds of propaganda, crowds of thin decision-making that's impulsive, not deliberative, and has no empathy and emotional intelligence, the system will give you Trump results. The system will give you demagoguery. The system will give you uh, shallowness and scapegoating and blood sacrifices cycle after cycle about why things aren't working so well. If you have deep thought, deep consideration, empathy, good communication, good social physics, good idea flow, then the system will give you beautiful things and beautiful outcomes. So you start small. And that old saying from Prometheus, big things have little beginnings. That's what we're doing tomorrow with the DC Fund 2. 250000 in the grand scheme of things is not a lot, but it has the ability to become a lot and grow a lot. And the system will evolve to a point where it can do all these things. So this is governance. Now, this roadmap discussion, Rick wants to do a vote as quickly as possible. And this is where I counter, well, how do you make sure it's a fair and representative vote? Well, I saw this with the Dow hack. Only 8% of the Ether holders voted. Is that fair? Is that representative? Vitalik thought so. 90% of the community ended up going with Vitalik. Now, did they do that because of that vote or did they do that because Vitalik decided? That's a decision you guys have to make. So I am very skeptical that in the next few weeks we can legitimize a community-driven roadmap with a democratic mandate. But you know what we can do is we can start developing priorities, thought leadership, and we can start utilizing idea scale, and we can treat this like one giant ballot. And you know what? Maybe in a little bit more time, maybe November, December, we actually get to a point where we can have a reasonable vote 
with a reasonable level of participation. So fund three during that time period. And Door and the rest of the team, uh, they're ready and willing. They work for you, the community. They really want to see these things get adopted. And that would be a great proto CIP. It's not exactly saying what we're going to do. We have a pretty good idea to finish off smart contracts and these other things, but the foundation has always been an enigma and we can definitely get a democratic mandate with these types of tools. And if it works there, it's a good indication that it's going to work in general for the rest of the system. So that's governance in a nutshell. It's the single hardest problem and it's a superset of all these other problems. And if you get it right, you build systems that are stable for a long time and ultimately systems that transcend all other systems because people know that that system is always growing and evolving and that's the fair one. And if they participate there, they will always feel like no matter who they are, where they come from, they matter and they have a voice. And you have to ask yourself in a marketplace of ideas, why would you want to join a cult? Why would you want to join a system where you have a leader? Why would you want to join a system where you have no voice or your voice doesn't matter as much as some other person. Why wouldn't you want to join a system where no matter who you are, what you do, there's always a place. There's always an opportunity to contribute. You can make a full-time job if you're a smart person willing to put in the time and thought of being a domain expert and actually get paid by the protocol. People ask you what you do. You say, I'm a thought leader. For what? For Cardano. That's a job? Oh yeah. Make a hundred grand a year. Eventually that's going to happen for somebody somewhere. And when you have those kind of dynamics, it's like obvious that that system will always be able to pick the best technology and will always be able to integrate the best technology, especially if you've already done the hard job of building a decentralized brain, which will give you more innovation than any of these other cults of personality around particular research groups and their particular famous scientists or so forth. So this is a hypothesis. We don't know if it's true or not. It's my opinion. And everything in Cardano has started with my opinion on a whiteboard. And what we've seen is some of it I got right and some of it I got wrong, but we are where we're at. And you know what? We are where we're at now with an army. We have a thousand plus SPOs. We didn't have that last year. We have that now. And they've done a phenomenal job making Cardano a dynamic and decentralized system. And we didn't have to worry about slashing or any of this other garbage. We went and did things differently. We produced something very different. And now we're doing it all over again, and we're physically reimagining in the most grand way possible how governance is supposed to work. If we do this, not only will we win, but we will change the world because this model can change election systems of countries and companies. And if it can do that, some countries and companies will do that. And if they do that, then we'll get different leadership and different outcomes. And we can start thinking about things in different time horizons and not worry so much about the short term and worry a lot more about the long term and also be able to deal with emerging existential threats to all of us, like AI and other things, in a responsible way and create a regulatory layer that makes sense for these things. The key is here. Bitcoin proved you could move value anywhere in the world to anybody in the world instantly. Ethereum proved that you can program things. You had a programming language for value. So you could replicate all the power of Wall Street on a blockchain and do all kinds of wonky, cool experiments. And Cardano, if we do this right, will fundamentally change the way that people relate to each other, interact with each other, and ultimately give consent about where we should all go. The burden is on our shoulders now to carry that enormous task, which is far greater than those who have come before us, which is why we are a true third generation cryptocurrency. We're not the smart contract chain, we're the governance chain. And this is our challenge. But I think we have the right strategy. I think we have the right humility and frankly, the right community and partners to get there. So tomorrow we're gonna start that discussion and you're all gonna start participating. Little by little, more and more will trickle in and we're going to wake up one day and hundreds of millions of people will have a voice. The largest government in the world has no country. And cho choices made that are completely digital, that have a huge impact on everything else. It's a beautiful thing. And it's a good life's work. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope this helps a little bit.
And until next time, have a nice day.